scriptures talk about a blessedness that happens to a man whose delight is in the law of God. So as someone says, it says, but his delight is in the law of God. And doth he meditate day and night. He says that that man is like a tree planted by the rivers of water, whose leaves do not wither, and who bears fruit in every season. As you are about listening to this message, we believe that your life is going to be like that man planted by the rivers of water. Your leaves are forever going to bear. And we know that your, your season will not pass by. You will forever shine and you will forever bear fruit. We have a lot of content to share with you. So we would entreat you to subscribe to this channel as well as like us. Hit that notification bell to receive more updates from us because we know that whatever content here is going to set you on calls at every time. It's going to make you attain whatever stature that Christ wants you to attain. Thank you. The Bible says he that is joined to Christ is one spirit. And then Paul helped us to understand our positional advantage that that word together or together with Christ is a very profound prophetic description of the believer's position now in light of what has happened. So you need to know who you are in light of who Christ is. Number three, you need to know your place in destiny and in God's prophetic program. I have taught you this. It's very important. You need to know your place. Your relevance is in your ability to keep and maintain your position. The provisions that are accorded your life are with respect to knowing your place. It's very important. You must know your place in God's program. You must know your place in destiny. Luke 4, 16 and 17, Jesus in the temple, reading the messianic prophecy that was about him, the Bible says he found where it was written concerning him. And then at the end of that rendition, he said, today is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Hebrews 10 and 7 says, Lo, I come in the volume of the book as it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Hallelujah. It's very, very important. Every believer must be trained to know your place in God's de in destiny and in God's prophetic program. Number four, that the second, the fourth um, <clears throat> dimension of knowledge is that you must understand the mysteries and the principles of the kingdom. This is very important. You must understand the mysteries and the principles of the kingdom. Job 38, 33 to 35, write it for reference. Knowest thou the ordinances of heaven, and canst thou set the dominion thereof in the earth? A discussion between God and Job. Psalm 82 and verse 5, popular scripture here. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness, and all the foundations of the earth are out of course. Matthew 13, 11, Jesus is still teaching. For it has been given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah. The kingdom operates using a modus operandi. There is a pattern. There is a principle. And every time you want to see the glory of God revealed, there is um, a mandate upon you that you must know the ways of God. Number five. What is the fifth dimension of knowledge if you must press into an excelling spiritual life you must understand man as the highest of god's creation and then you must understand the world system the cosmos it is not enough to understand the principles of the kingdom you must understand man as the zenith the highest of god's creation and then you must understand the cosmos this is important when we discuss this we considered psalm 8 from verse 1 to 6 remember Psalm 8, 1 to 6, O Lord our God, how excellent is your name, he says, all of that, when I consider the works of your hands, and all of that, when we get to verse 5, he now says, what is man, or verse 4, what is man that thou art mindful of him, not the son of man that thou visitest him. I hope we're still together. 
I'm showing you that if you want to explore your spiritual growth, it is important that you follow this sequence. Otherwise, something will be lopsided as far as your spiritual understanding is concerned. You must know man because this is the world of men. Psalm 115 verse 16. The Bible says the heaven of heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth has he given to the children of men. If you must excel in the cosmos, you need to understand the world of men. Hallelujah. In fact, in Matthew 10, 16, I believe, Jesus was teaching them. And you notice when Jesus began to teach, if you study the Beatitudes theologically, Jesus began to teach them relating the kingdom with and contrasting it with the cosmos. There were times where he would teach them things that were largely eternal and spiritual, but in many instances, he would now delve to help them understand the cosmos. This was one of such discussions. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. He says, be ye therefore wise as serpents. All through scripture, a serpent has always been associated with evil, Satan, the devil. Are we together now? And here Jesus is saying that you need to borrow the wisdom of the serpent and the character of the dove if you must excel in the cosmos. Very strange teaching. For the simple information that you are a sheep in the midst of wolves, he says there are two dimensions of wisdom and approach you must have. You need to be as wise as a serpent and you need to be as harmless as a dove. And the only place in scripture where you learn the wisdom of the serpent is Egypt. You will have to go to Egypt to learn the wisdom of the serpent. Hallelujah. And the Bible says as harmless as a dove. So number six, very quickly. What is the final dimension of knowledge that the believer must have? You must know your adversary, the devil. I'm doing a recap for those of us who have been following the series, but this is important. I need to say this so you understand what I'm explaining today. You must know your adversary, the devil. The devil is not your friend? No, sir. The devil is not a confidant. The Bible calls him the thief, John 10:10, 10, 10, the thief. A description that Jesus himself gave many bad names Satan is called he's called a murderer he's called an accuser of the brethren he's called a thief in this case that he comes except he does not come except to steal to kill and to destroy first Peter chapter 5 Apostle Peter was teaching us in verse 8 and 9 he says be sober first Peter 5 8 and 9 be sober, be vigilant, he says, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Verse 9, he says, whom resist steadfast in the faith. Whom resist, it is within your power. Let me tell you this, no matter what you know, as far as spiritual information is concerned, if you do not understand Satan, and the dark world, the demonic kingdom, you will be incapacitated in ways you cannot imagine. Are we together now? Yes. When I was discussing this, I taught you that as an expert, when they teach you about accidents, the goal is not for you to go and die in a car crash, but you can never be called a professional. There is a whole course on plane crashes when you study aviation and you are being trained to become a professional pilot. They simulate many kinds of plane crashes and they teach you how to circumvent them. It is on account of that you are certified as a professional pilot. Are we together? There are many believers in an attempt to remain positive have ignored the reality of the dark world. Jesus himself it revealed many aspects of Satan. It was Jesus. In fact, our understanding about the operation of Jesus as far as the gospel, uh, operation of Satan, as far as the gospel is concerned, was revealed by Jesus himself. And then Paul came and structured the satanic kingdom. And he said, do not be unaware of the wiles or the devices of the devil. Do not be ignorant, he says. So you must know God, 
you must know yourself in light of who Christ is. You must know your place in destiny and God's prophetic program. You must understand the mysteries and the principles of the kingdom. You must understand man and the cosmos. And then you must understand your adversary, the devil. Show me any believer who would have invested a major portion of his work exploring these dimensions of knowledge. I show you one who it will be impossible to be a weak believer. Hallelujah. Strength in the kingdom is a cumulative of your knowledge, the light that has come from these various dimensions of knowledge. Hallelujah. And then I also taught you that there are four channels to knowing God. This is very important. I hope I'm still with you. Well, we're still together. Four channels to knowing God. That everybody who now wants to know God, there are four channels. Number one is scripture. The first recommendation as far as the knowledge of God is concerned is scripture. Our first port of call as believers who seek to know God and to know Jesus is scripture. Hallelujah. The Bible tells us in... Um, John chapter 1 from verse 1 to 3 in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God verse 2 says the same was in the beginning with God 3 says all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made so the word is God and scripture is very important hallelujah this is very very important scripture reveals the character of God and scripture reveals the methodologies of God. Number two, very quickly, the second channel for learning and knowing God is a careful study on his names. Remember that the names of God capture various dimensions of his power and his might. The names of God, Exodus chapter 3, 13 to 15. Exodus 3, 13 to 15. Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come to the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? 14 now. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. He said, Thus shall thou say to the children of Israel, I am hath sent me to you. 15 now. He says, and God said, listen, moreover to Moses, thus shall thou say to the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob had sent me to you. He says, this is my name forever and this is my memorial unto all generations. Now go to chapter 6, same Exodus chapter 6 from verse 1. Then the Lord said unto Moses, we are reading to verse 3. Don't be tired of writing scripture. Thou shalt, it says, now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he let them go. And with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. Verse 2. And God spake unto Moses, saying, I am the Lord. Verse 3. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. He says, but by my name, Jehovah, was I not known to them. So God reveals himself according to his names. In fact, the various names of God that we know from scripture, as you have been taught, were trapped there were experiences, manifestations of the power, the wisdom, the grace of God. Every time they saw God move in a dimension that was foreign to them, they would trap it in a name and build a memorial around it. So that every time you wanted to learn that dimension of God, you are referred to that name. That's how we came about with Jaira, Sikenu, are we together now? And all of these versions of his name. So four channels to knowing God. Number one, scripture. Number two, the names of God. Number three, Jesus Christ. This is powerful. Jesus Christ himself 
came as an explanation of God. I told you that Jesus came among the many reasons why he came up to the earth was as a manuscript and a marking script. He came as a correction to our understanding about God. Are we together? That the prior knowledge that the prophets and the patriarchs had had about God because until Jesus came, no one could know God accurately. Until Jesus came, there were gaps in their understanding of God. Why? Because they had to depend on the perception of any prophet who was in charge at that time to reveal God to them. The possibility of a personal experience with God as we know, widespread, was not given to them as a privilege. There were few people who either by the election of grace or just by reason of certain covenants had the privilege of encountering God but as a nation and as a people even though God's people they had to interpret they had to depend on the interpretation of God that was given to them by the prophets and the prophets did their best but they made a lot of mistakes there were many things they credited to God that God had no hand in are we together and I hope you know when you study scripture you will see that even among the prophetic in the Old Testament there was a doubling between authentic work with God and there were times they delved into divination there were times where so there were many perspectives that they brought together and in ancient times anything that was beyond the realm of science and this three-dimensional realm they largely credited it to God so Jesus came as an explanation he came as a correction of our perception about God that means using the lens of the person Jesus we can judge every other prophet and every other person who has said anything about God whatever they said about God we bring it to the lens of Jesus as the incarnate now are we together and then we test what they said God was as against what Jesus came to manifest. And anything that we find in defiance or in contrast to what Jesus was revealing, then we knew that something had to be corrected about their understanding of God. It's the reason why they got angry every time Jesus called himself God or the Son of God. They said, you are a young boy who was born in our presence here. How would you dare say that you are God? They were angry especially the scribes and the Pharisees. He said, before your, Abra your father Abraham I was, and they wanted to stone him. They said, this guy's blasphemy has gotten too much. Let's just kill him before he teaches this nonsense across the city. They were uncomfortable. But you see, the truth is that Jesus came as a revelation of the Father. You find all that captured in John's synoptic account, chapter 1 from verse 1 to 6. The Bible says the word became flesh and then it dwelt among us and we beheld his glory even as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth so he was the word incarnate he walked upon the earth Hebrews chapter 1 God who in sundry times and diverse manner spake to us in time past through the prophets hath in these last days verse 2 spoken to us through his son whom he had appointed heir of all things by whom also he had made the worlds verse 3 now the bible says who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person so jesus came as the express image of the father that means if you had never seen the father you had never related with the father if you looked at jesus he came as an explanation an accurate explanation of the father why do we know that Jesus represented the Father properly? Because the Father himself gave a public word of commendation. He said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And he mandated creation to hear him. Are we together? So we learn God as we study Jesus. Finally, the fourth channel for learning and knowing God is through experience. There is a place for experience. Job 42 and verse 5. It was Job who taught us this through his pain. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear. It says, but now my eye seeth thee. You can know God through experience. 1 John chapter 1 from verse 1. We're reading to 5. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. I'm giving you a lot of scripture, write it in Jesus' name. Endure sound doctrine. 
in Jesus matchless name we have prayed John 1 well, let's do 1 to 5 you won't believe that I've not even started my teaching just night but this is important write it down that which was from the beginning which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes are we together which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life verse 2 for the life was manifested and we have seen it this were eyewitnesses and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the father and was manifest unto us verse 3 that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the father and with his son jesus christ two more verses and these things write we unto you that your joy might be full the last verse now this then is the message he says which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him there is no darkness Apostle John is saying listen we were eyewitnesses we walked with Jesus we sat with him he taught us we were direct products of his mentorship and so when we teach you you must be able to believe believe that we're not just teaching you cunningly devised fables you can know God through experience hallelujah <laughs> are we still together let's pray in the spirit for one minute Jesus Sila kapo sabranda kabalako siyata Thank you for understanding. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 17. Something happened in Athens. Acts chapter 17. Let's begin our reading from verse 16 to 17. Then we'll jump to 22 to 24. Now watch this. The Bible says, While Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him, when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry this was paul the apostle he entered into athens and he saw that the people were given to idolatry verse 17. therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met him he kept arguing and said listen something is wrong you people are zealous people but this is idolatry jump to verse 22 the bible says then paul stood in the midst of the mars hill and said ye men of athens i perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious verse 3 23 now for as i pass by he says and beheld your devotions so this were a people who were zealous and committed i found an altar with this inscription to the unknown god whom ye therefore ignorantly worship this ignorance your devotion worshiping an unknown god he says i have come to give you clarity about that god because when I came into Athens, I saw a lot of religiosity. He said, you are even too superstitious. Use your, the mind of your imagination to imagine a city. Everywhere you went, there were monuments, there were traditional practices. Everybody was suggesting anything. And they had to build an altar. They said, we know this much. Whoever this God is. And they put in an inscription there. We don't know you, but we'll keep worshiping you. What a tragedy to the unknown God how do you become so devoted to an unknown God worshiping an unknown God how do you know he has answered you how do you know you are not in error who corrects who and by what standard keep that scripture there please I want you to look at that scripture very carefully as I pass by you know what that meant Paul I like Paul Paul just kept going around Athens from one region to the other and he said everybody was bowing down worshiping others had a set of knowledge there were ideas people were mentoring others and yet there was widespread ignorance in athens and paul said you even built an altar 
and you openly wrote an inscription on it to the unknown God. In other words, we are so devoted, we love this God and we wish we could know him. But since he has chosen not to reveal himself to us, our devotion continues even in ignorance. Does that sound like a generation? Does that sound like an individual? If a whole territory can worship an unknown God, there are many people today who have died to an unknown God. There are many people today who have argued about an un unknown God. There are many people today, respectfully speaking, preaching about an unknown God, advocating, doing, an evan doing evangelism to an unknown God, bringing seeds, tithing, giving to an unknown God. And Paul said, I have come to declare him to you. Let's look at verse 24. It says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. And when you begin to read, he started explaining to them. Now he was bringing perspective to this unknown God. Please look up. Do you know, ladies and gentlemen, that what happened in Athens is still true in many, many lives today. There are many people who have written songs to an unknown God. Received all kinds of pain to an unknown God. Serving in a church that they believe is owned by an unknown God. Writing books dedicated to an unknown God. This is from a standpoint of love. I hope you understand me. The goal is to give us perspective. Is it not amazing the zeal of the average Christian in Africa? Africa is about one of the most religious continents. Passionate people. I mean, you, is it spiritual exercises of widespread fasting? Is it spiritual exercise of honor to spiritual authorities? I mean, you find the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in many regards in Africa. You find it down Middle East. There is devotion in a way. If you've had the privilege of traveling across the globe, even whether it is in your mind or physically, it will still achieve the same result. Are we together? And you see the kind of devotion. There are priests across the globe in the Christendom, in every other religious expression, you will see the sacrifices, consecrations, fastings, abstinence, devotion, and you are wondering, this widespread devotion, there are parents who have quarreled their children, behave well, God is not happy with you. The question is which God? How about we servants of the Lord Jesus Christ? We have taught series and series about God. We have spoken about heaven. We have cried on crusade grounds, beckoning on thousands, praying for millions to come to this God. And they respond faithfully. Then they walk up to us. And then we lead them. We say, say after me, God or their Lord Jesus. And at the end of it, respectfully speaking, largely both the preacher and the new convert are not even aware of who they are talking to <laughs> hallelujah no wonder there is usually a problem of conviction in light of situations in light of you know negative situations especially so you find out that there is a vacillation of convictions today we stand strong I know God will heal me I know it shall end up in praise and then eventually our convictions begin to dwindle because in truth we are not sure we made boastful statements but now we are not sure again you see it's already happening to so many people on one hand we say no this God if it is my God I know him I know he will come through for this family. I know he can't leave me down. And then eventually, we begin to negotiate so many things and say, I, I don't even know again. God, is it your will? There are many people angry with God today because they were taught to believe in an unknown God. And they believed in that unknown God and many things that they believed he would do were not done. And in anger now, there are many, many people who do not even want the mention of church. 
do not want the mention of anything they say God has failed me I have a plethora of failure there's too much failure in my life what kind of a God is this I read in the Bible that he's almighty I read in the Bible that he's all-powerful I read in the Bible that the cattle on a thousand hill belongs to him and here am I serving God loving him in church and then it looks like he does not want to attend to me do you know respectfully speaking sometimes people send me text messages and I know they are doing it sincerely they say apostle since God has not had me this is my prayer request help me and tell him that we need yes sir and now you don't laugh at them at least I admit my ignorance that I don't know him you who claims to know him please help me the most important thing is his ears not who is talking let him just be aware that there are needs in my life like this as simple as this message is ladies and gentlemen what I'm about to share with you will bring you liberation there is something if you do not know God in truth your life and your Christian experience will be full of assumption and gaps you will keep being promoted ministerially until the day you hit a wall and all those who are following you will ask, which God exactly are we worshiping and then I hope you know, last I checked, I hope my facts are still right. There are about 4,000 religions and growing. And many of them are becoming similar now because they are pseudo expressions of one another. So how do I know I am not in error? How do I know the God I'm serving is the God of the Bible? There are all kinds of arguments and debates about God. I like Paul. Paul is teaching us something today that he taught the believers in Athens. And so he gathered the people and said there is need for a conference immediately and he said ladies and gentlemen first let me commend your zeal I see that you are even so superstitious imagine that you went to Athens and you said this God wants you to give him money and everybody will come and say oh yeah God where are you another person will say God does not need your money he say God give me back my money I was told that you are too rich Another person says, God wants you to fast and pray. Another person says, God is not interested in fasting and prayer. Another person says, God demands consecration and devotion, respectfully. And then another one says, it doesn't matter. So believers are now confused because remember, all of this is to please this God. And for many, he still remains an unknown God. Someone says, if you want him to bless you with increase, do this. Another person says, just believe him and give thanks. And many believers are saying, God, can you come and help us clear the air? Who is right and who for God? We want to believe you sincerely, but who are you? No wonder Moses asked that question. He said, who will I go and tell Pharaoh now? I hope you know Moses was trained in Egypt. He was supposed to be the next Pharaoh. But he ran away. So he said, if I go and tell Pharaoh, God has sent me. Pharaoh said, dear preacher, I hope you know there are many gods in Egypt. Which of them now has sent you? And Moses said, before you send me, before I go and disgrace myself and cause pain to the people, please reveal yourself to me. Let my confidence be anchored upon the truth of the God I have met. And God said, I am that I am. Mm, I am that I am. Ladies and gentlemen, every generation that had men and women who shook that generation, especially spiritually, their impact and their exploit was directly connected to their genuine encounters with God. Make reference to my teaching the value of spiritual encounters. But it's important for you to understand this. Many people have not taken the time to know God. We can know about God, but the knowledge of God now just as an example if someone suddenly sent you a text now and says apostle is in US right now and is about to preach in a conference because you know me and you know that except otherwise every Sunday I am here something about me with respect to my assignment will make you it will not it will not even be a prayer point are we together now there is something about God when you know even the prophetic will not threaten you again because you can judge it from the lens of your knowledge of God. There is something about God when you know fear dies immediately. Because there is something about God that if you do not understand, he will look like a killer who can destroy you. And then in another place, he looks like he's indefinitely merciful. And yet the Bible captures all these dimensions of him. 
as a lion and as a lamb you still find it there as a warrior and as a merciful God you still find it there are we together there were people that God took things from and there were people God gave things to so which which God should I serve the songs we sing they all belong to you and even the air we breathe it all belongs to you after singing that beautiful rendition and then an intelligent person will say but please my dear brother can you help me describe or explain for me this God you have served for 20 years I'm listening talk to me what are you going to say about him oh he's the creator of the heavens and the earth I can tell you this God is mighty and he says no, that's not what I'm asking you who is he if it is true that he wants to be known if it is true that he wants to be served if it is true that he has sent me how do you represent a God you do not know now you say he has called you light he's called you salt he's an ambassador you're sent to as an ambassador you even claim that he has sent you to your family like he sent moses to egypt so you stand before the altars that have plagued your family for years the harpalist knows who he's serving and he will tell you i know him we were introduced there now you have come and you want to dislodge his power i don't argue but who is this god the prophets of baal they got to a point where they knew Baal so much and the Bible says they called upon Baal and they were surprised probably for the first time in their prophetic journey Baal disappointed them Baal we do not we didn't expect that you would disappoint us to a point that they lacerated themselves devotion to an unknown God and Elijah said call him louder you claim you know him let him come and defend his name and when it was time, Elijah said, now you watch the living God. He set up 12 stones. He said, pour water on it. This one is not experiment. There is something about God you must know. Pour water, fire is about to come. He said, add it again, seven times. And then he said, clear the way. And he lifted up his eyes. He did not pray twice. He did not pray three times. The Bible says fire came from heaven and licked up the water. Hallelujah. When David stood before Goliath, Goliath looked at him and said, Am I a dog, Israel? With all my might and experience, you bring this small boy? You want me to kill him in a way that will leave you with bad memories? And when he was done talking, I will show you the scripture later on. David looks at him and says, that is none of my business. You see, I did not come with a sword. You should be afraid already that I'm coming to fight you and I did not come with a sword. Can you imagine that you come to me with your bows and your spears, but there is something I know about God. I have come to you in a name. He never said I came with a sling. I came with a name that he has revealed. I know what he can do. I know what he can do. Those who know God indeed, they shall be strong. Truly, they shall be strong. That you can see death to the face and say, I know who sent me. Believers, please hear me. Our stability, especially in the days that are coming, will not just be based on your connection to a man of God. It will be based on your connection to the God you know. The God you know is the God you will serve your generation with. And this, this discussion tonight is to help you take away the haziness. We have made a lot of bold statements. God will not fail me and yet we are failing. And so people say, okay, I was patient to listen to you for 12 years. Where is this God? And you too now, you have to go back and say, God, truly, where are you? Hello, scriptures exhort us from the book of Proverbs. It says, my son, attend to my sins, incline thy ears to my words. Let them not depart from thy eyes and keep them in the midst of thee. As you have listened to this message, we believe that you are going to reap the blessings thereof if you attend to these words as well.
that you will keep these words in the midst of your heart. That no matter the circumstance, your eyes are going to be fixed on these words. And as you have been blessed, we will tell you to share this message. Be an evangelist by sharing to others to be blessed. And then subscribe to this channel for us because we have loads of videos. We have loads of content that is going to make you blessed. That is going to set you on course. That is going to set you ablaze. And don't forget to like for us. Thank you.